in physical higher education in the UK. So these open for forum events are aimed at uh, facilitating that sharing. So there are two events per term, and we welcome anyone who would like to come and talk about EDI work in their department or organizations. And uh, Lordan uh, Nushin is one of our, uh, are you, you are the chair of this organization now, I must pretty think so, sorry. I'm trying to figure things out as I go as well. So we are, if it's okay, Gillian, I noticed that you are unmuted, would you, mind starting uh, your presentation. Yeah. I will say that uh, Gillian Moore is the former director of uh, Music and Performing Arts <coughs> at the Southland Centre and currently uh, Artistic Associate, uh, developing new large-scale project and collaborative initiatives for music and creative engagement at the South Bank Centre in London. And you, I'll leave it to you to talk about what you are going to talk about. Yes, and, and I understand that You'd like me to talk for about 12, 15 minutes, is that right? Ginny? Yeah, you're okay. you can have up to 20 minutes. That's, right, that's yeah. fine, yeah. Okay, that's fine. And then we'll place um, the questions. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. Thank you very much. It's great to see you all. Um, I'm in a dressing room at the Queen Elizabeth Hall, um, one of our swankier dressing rooms. So I hope I don't get interrupted because I haven't actually booked it, but um, you never know. Um, but it's nice to be right here at the centre of South Bank Centre at this great uh, sort of cultural um, people's palace, I guess, um, as it was designed in the 1950s um, after the war um, in the middle of London on the banks of the Thames. Um, I'm going to, apologies if I'm going to be um, a bit personal, a bit historic, a bit anecdotal, but I wanted to give really quite a personal perspective as someone working in the industry to this question of um, equality, um, of inclusion and equality uh, and whether those are separate th are, are um, opposing things. Um, I'm going to talk about the idea that the professional arts and music in particular in which I work, it only makes sense, the professional end of uh, music only makes sense and um, it only ultimately is what is called in the title of this conference quality um, if it's part of an active and inclusive musical society. So just to get to the personal, um, I was born in the East End of Glasgow and when I was 18 months old, we were sent out um, by Glasgow City Council to a shiny new council estate in the middle of Greenfield in Renfrewshire. This, this was part of what was called the Glasgow Overspill. Um, as one and then two extra sisters came along, we moved into a bigger flat in a brutalist concrete estate. And when I was 10, we moved into an ex-mining town in Lanarkshire. We moved away into an ex-mining town in Lancashire, of which the main cultural output was orange bands and marches every other Saturday. But the defining feature of my childhood was culture and specifically music. Um, in parenthesis, it's only really recently that I've come to acknowledge that the orange marches that I talked about, I was slightly dismissive about there, were also part of a culture, even if my distaste for the sectarianism that went with them still persists. My mum, who'd had no um, education beyond the age of 15 herself, took me to orchestral concerts when, from the age of when I was six. Um, at home, at church and at school, there was singing and piano playing. There was a merciless ritual at family gatherings where each of us had to do our turn, as we put it, regardless of skill levels, which, believe me, varied widely. Um, in time, my dad, with his light church choir tenor voice, joined the SNO, the Scottish National Orchestra Chorus, and sang Mahler symphonies with Pierre Boulez at the Proms in London and Elgar's Dream of Gerontius with Alexander Gibson conducting. We also heard tales about great aunts and great uncles from the past, people from the East End of Glasgow who had toured the world in the 1930s and 40s with the hugely popular Glasgow Orpheus Choir. This was an amateur ensemble for working people as it was termed. Um, it was an extraordinary thing. They were kind of rock stars in their day. They went to America, they sold um, more records than 
um, that they, you know, they were sort of, if, they, if they'd had charts in those days, they would have been at the top of them. They were extremely famous in those days, but it was ordinary people making music. And underneath that, Glasgow Orpheus Square, the kind of world-class bit of it, there was a huge edifice of training choirs and community choirs in the, I'm talking about in the first part of the 20th century in Glasgow, the kind of thing that we might think of as innovative today, but in fact, there is nothing new under the sun. Um, although I was the first person in my family ever to have any kind of professional role in the arts, my father, who died recently of dementia, um, and music was about the last thing, the only thing that communicated with him in the last years of his life, he used to say, I just don't get this thing about classical music being elitist. We were singing Schubert songs in our council houses. So my point really is that music in my family at the time when I was growing up was part of the everyday. It was ordinary, but with a bit of magic. It brought a kind of magic to our lives, but it was very much part of our lives. And things got even more magic for me when I went to the Royal Scottish Academy of Music and Drama, as it was then, now the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland, Saturday Junior Department, age 13. I've got this picture in my mind of a group of my friends hanging out in, on the steps of the old Victorian building, which is now a Thai restaurant. Um, but we used to do this. We used to stand on those steps of this beautiful red sandstone building every Saturday. We were all from very similar, all my friends were from very similar backgrounds to mine. Yes, we were all white, but we were all state school, council estate kids. One, one of them became a six, successful violinist and is now director, in fact, of that very state junior conservatoire. One became principal cello of one of the world's leading chamber orchestras. One became director of culture for the city of Glasgow. So apologies if all this sounds a bit sentimental. I know that I and my friends were the lucky product of the long tail of the post-war settlement, which gave us the education at the NHS, the Edinburgh Festival and the South Bank Centre, where I am sitting right now. Um, but I'm less confident, if I'm honest, that a girl from my background and from my friend's background could now make that journey that I did. I grew up with opportunities in my community, with music teaching in my state schools, with county youth orchestras, with, uh, with, um, uh, which took me to Scotland through scholarships to uh, junior conservatoire, with music making, as I mentioned, in church and at an amateur level throughout. Um, and we know um, that the statistics for music conservatoires still have a marked and disproportionately high proportion of privately educated students. If you look at, I think, the Royal Academy of Music at the moment, it's um, very similar to Oxford and Cambridge. Perhaps, I think it, at one point recently, it was even more, I, I should have checked that um, most recent statistic. Um, but more directly pertinent to what we're talking about today, I grew up in an active musical society among amateurs who sometimes, like my dad and like me, uh, bumped in, up against the professional, but mostly did what we did at our own level for our own purposes. And of course, that's historically the way music has been um, in society since whenever the first music happened back in the midst of time. I went recently to a conference, I spoke recently at a conference where the central thesis is that music is and must be an active participatory endeavour that everybody can be involved in and that our professional musicians should be trained to play an active creative role in a, music, in a musical society. I'd argue that this active free association of professional and wider community is the edifice on which the classical music tradition of which I'm part was built over centuries. More specifically, I'm struck by the fact that it could be convincingly argued that this is the principle and practice on which British art music was reinvented in the early 20th century by some key creative um, uh, figures. It was also proposed in that conference that I was speaking at, which was at the Guildhall, that artistic and social practice should, um, should not be in opposition, which is, I think, one of the, the kind of central thesis of this day. Um, I think I can back that up with some history. Um, so looking at the, the beginning of the 20th century um, in the UK, uh, just at the time when the German scholar Oskar Schmidt penned the stinging description of England in particular, not necessarily to mention Scotland, but England as the slant on a musique. This was the time when Vaughan Williams and his friend Gustav Holst, who met at the Royal College of Music, were committed and committing themselves 
to finding a new language for English art music, as well as going out into um, rural communities and recording, preserving, encouraging, and shining a spotlight on the musical traditions of ordinary people, what we might call folk music. They define themselves by a progressive view of what a composer's role, a musician's role in society should be. Um, Vaughan Williams, who is celebrating just last week, uh, we celebrated his 150th anniversary, of course, and so much, you know, rubbish has been written or spoken about Vaughan Williams. I heard some on Radio 4 the other day about, you know, him being the great patriot. Well, he may have been a patriot, but he had quite a radical view. Artists should be the servant of the state was one of the, was the rather unexpectedly socialist declaration from the patrician Vaughan Williams. He was a, um, he was from sort of artistic aristocracy, Darwin, intellectual aristocracy, Darwin on one side, the Wedgwoods on the other. Um, and he and his friend Holst spent a lifetime encouraging participation in music making from Vaughan Williams' writing of the English hymnal. And um, he, you know, he, he worked out, he was invited to do this when he was a young man in his 20s, but he worked out that, you know, the church was at that time the place where most ordinary people experienced music. So they needed to experience the best instead of what he referred to as the Victorian stodge that they'd been served up before. Um, he also ran community, community music festivals later in his life and he helped set up the Arts Council, the National Youth Orchestra. And of course, Gustav Holst, who had even more explicitly political motivation um, for the way he viewed his life as an artist. He directed work of choirs. He was a music director of Morley College, just around the corner from here, which was specifically set up by Emma Korn for the education of working people. I was really amused recently um, when Penny Mordaunt used um, Jupiter in her um, in her promotional video to be Tory party leader with images of Union Jacks and battleships. And I, I really wanted to just um, write to her and tell her what Gustav Faust was really about. And she might have chosen something else. Um, this tradition continued into the next generation of great of British composers. Gustav Holst's daughter Imogen toured the, world, toured the country during the war as a community musician working in rural communities. Michael Tippett took on Holst's job at Morley College and himself worked in mining communities in the north of England just before the war during the Depression and wrote about, if you read his memoirs, he wrote about how he found it difficult to go back to just being a composer and a desk. And in fact, that's not what he did. He devoted himself to really working with people to make music. Benjamin Britten, who said in his famous 1964 speech in Aspen, Colorado, that he wasn't interested in the view of posterity for his music, but he wanted his music to be of use in the here and now in the community in which he lived and worked to the people who surrounded him very locally. And subsequently, people like Peter Maxwell Davis, who set up a festival and wrote music for and about his adopted community in Orkney. Judith Weir, who when she accepted the role of the master of Queen's the Queen's music um, about eight years ago, said that she'd be traveling in the country, encouraging amateur music making, working in schools and increasing involvement in music. And she has. On James McMillan's inspiring Cumlet Trice Festival, which brings world-class music make making to his ex-mining hometown of Cumlet in Ayrshire. I had the privilege of visiting the festival for the first time last year, and I can vouch for the fact that it really matters to people of all ages. It's making a difference in schools, and there's been a real change in um, in the level of music education in schools and in the facilities in schools, all spurred by Jimmy McMillan bringing in himself being a world-class musician and really shining a light on that musical community and giving opportunities. From, from Vaughan Williams and Holt to Judith Weir to James McMillan, these artists um, are what was described in the Guildhall Conference um, that I was at um, at the beginning of the year as makers in society or citizen artists, which the Americans like to call it. And that's a tradition that I think we should be proud of and which continues. Um, the great majority of public funding in the arts in the UK goes to support professional arts. The origin of the Arts Council of England was in this uh, was in SEMA. The thing I mentioned with um, Imogen Holst that she was part of the Council for the Encouragement of Music and the Arts 
set up during World War II to encourage amateur activity, as well as funding professional musicians to perform to servicemen and women and to encourage music and dance and drama in communities. Um, there are wonderful descriptions of Imogen Holst in her, again, in her memoir. I would really, again, if you think, um, like I have done at some point in my life that we, you know, we invented all this in the last 30 years or so of her being in, uh, uh, in with a mother and baby group in a, a women's institute in the West Country, um, getting extraordinary sounds out of this group of women who insisted at the beginning of the session they couldn't sing and plucking harmonies out of the air, she said. Um, the founding of the Arts Council out of FEMA after the war was, of course, a great thing. Um, but Anthony Everett, in writing about amateur music in the, in the 1990s, in a book called Joining In, he argued that this was the moment where the balance shifted too much away from participatory music making and towards the professional, to the, de to, to the detriment of an active and engaged wider musical community. It would be perverse to argue, especially sitting as I do in this building here, against the funding of professional artists. It's vital that we can all experience the thrill of performances by people who spend their lives dedicated to music. And it's also vital that everybody can see the possibility of making a living in the arts. But it's also vital that everybody has the opportunity to join in music making for their own enjoyment and fulfillment at whatever their level, like my family, and to be those active listeners for our professional musicians. Some signs are encouraging. We know that just pre-pandemic adult participation in choirs in the UK was at an all-time high with around 2.5 million. And in the recently published 10-year strategy to cover the years 20, 20 to 2030 um, that the art from the Arts Council of England it's called Let's Create and we'll hear the results of the um, applications to become funded organisations um, under that strategy next week. And the Arts Council seems to have reached back for its inspiration to its wartime roots, encouraging active creative participation in the arts by everyone alongside supporting arts professionals. Um, the first desired outcome of the strategy is entitled Creative People and suggests that everyone can develop and express creativity through their life. That's everyone. That's not just about supporting professional groups. And the second is that cultural communities, and it's called cultural communities, and it has the intention that villages, towns and cities thrive through a collaborative approach to culture. This is heady stuff. It's music to my ears, although of course it's caused alarm um, in the professional um, arts world because people are concerned um, that it might mean that there is a less, it's a less obvious path to funding for professional arts organisations. But I guess um, my feeling at the moment is that um, it's absolutely if, it, if they get it right, it could be a very exciting moment where we can rebalance things so that we are looking after this active creative community rather than this kind of what's been, you know, this outreach top down approach, which, you know, I've been part of, many of us have been part of in the past where um, the, the professional arts are funded first. And then I guess you'd call it in the current parlance trickle down. Um, trickle down arts practice and then they decide whether or not they want to go out and spread the word to um, a wider group of people. Um, of course this thinking also presents a clear challenge for training and education, for training in, in music and the arts. Um, it seems of course that musical training should be about acquiring the highest level of skills at the same time as equipping musicians to be part of an active musical society. I spoke recently at the, um, just a month ago, at the, gave a keynote speech at the um, beginning of term at the um, Amsterdam Conservatoire, where they're grappling with exactly this question. They're grappling with um, the idea that they want to be creating the best possible musicians, but at the same time, they need to be equipping musicians for the world as it is in the 21st century and making sure that their musicians are part of an active and creative musical society. Just can I just check at this moment? Am I okay for time? You're Second you're okay. You, you if you if you start to kind of round off, that would be good. But you're okay. Okay, that's fine. 
Um, I will. Um, yes. So I'll, I'll I'll talk about I'll, I'll talk about that because so for so a key question um, for those uh, teachers at the Amsterdam Conservatoire was again this idea that um, that there is a there is perhaps a um, mismatch between um, the the thought of creating the best possible musicians, the highest possible standard, um, the greatest possible um, performers um, and, and composers um, at the so-called high level of quality and people who are actually at ease um, working in a community, working with amateur musicians, going into schools and encouraging and teaching and, and bringing uh, and making sure that we are part of an active musical society. What I did in that talk was that I spoke to them about I showed them examples, not only what the ones I just discussed from history, and um, so you know, Von William Post, Benjamin Britten, um, Imogen Holst, etc., and talked about those fantastic musicians really using um, the idea that they were embedded in a community to inform what they did um, as artists at the highest level, but also looking at current examples of inspiring musicians whom you could never argue were not really at the top of their game, but have who have chosen as a vital part of their practice to um, engage and include a wider society. So I talked, for example, about Nicola Benedetti, one of our greatest international um, violin soloists. Um, and she, as many of you will know, three years ago, founded the Benedetti Foundation, which is a, now a huge enterprise, which is designed to encourage and give quality input to uh, young people. And during the pandemic, this became an absolutely enormous enterprise. I talked about Chichi Nwanako, one of our um, leading double bass players in this country who got fed up in, in about 2014. She, she, she finally had had enough, got fed up of being the only person of color in any orchestra that she uh, was involved in. And she decided to form Chinake. And that has changed the way, it, it shifted the debate on, um, on where we are uh, with race and um, ethnicity and classical music, and there are no excuses anymore. She, uh, when the in this very building in the Queen Elizabeth Hall, when Chinnike Orchestra walked onto the stage, an all black orchestra walked onto the stage of the Queen Elizabeth Hall, and a whole audience stood up, and then they began to give an amazing account of Beethoven's Seventh Sym Symphony. That in that moment removed every excuse that everybody had ever made about, oh, we have to, you know, we have to start from the bottom. It's you can't just make gestures that showed that you can and it worked. Um, and then I talked about Marin Olsop, who herself, you know, has that uncomfortable position of being a pioneer, of being the first woman to do so many things, including being uh, in charge of, a, um, of an American major orchestra, being the first woman to conduct it last night of the proms and the second woman to conduct it the last night of the proms. So that's, um, that's not so great, is it? Um, but, um, talking about Marin and how she is one of the world's great conductors, but she gives an enormous amount of her energy to ensuring that there are generations behind her doing that. I talked about the um, the para orchestra set up by Charles um, by by Char uh, Charles Hazelwood, um, leading conductor, um, who wanted to uh, having um, had a dis um, disabled family members wanting to ensure that the path was open for um, disabled musicians to have a professional, to, to take a, their part, their place on the professional stage. But I think one clear and obvious thing I wanted to um, finish with, um, a way in which professional musicians can re-find their place in society, um, another, another particular way beyond outreach, be, beyond special initiatives, is actually by, this is sort of counterintuitive to me, again, sitting in this palace of culture, but, but by removing themselves day to day from places like this, central, in central cities and places where people come for culture and living their day to day lives among people who don't ne wouldn't necessarily otherwise have access um, to that. So, um, I, I was looking at examples such as um, Future Lab in Bremen in Germany, which is the Deutsche Kammerphilharmonie, who have for the last, I think, 15 years or so, literally lived, been based, rehearsal studios, offices, 
um, and many performances in a in a school in a secondary school um, in a, a, an economically challenged area of the city of Clayman. They the musicians line up every day for lunch with the kids in the schools. They work with their families, and that has really that has had measurable um, effect on the outcomes for those young people. The South Bank's resident orchestra, the Orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment, has re recently done something similar and moved into Ackland Burley School in North London. Um, the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra has closed its central London offices and moved to the heart of a community in the London borough of Brent. And the City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra um, has, in fact, you may have just read this, in the last couple of weeks, they've just announced the opening next year of um, the CBSO Academy, um, which is a secondary school where the orchestra will be based every single day, um, and they will be living and working alongside um, the young people in that school. So the aim with those projects is that, like in my childhood, music will become part of the everyday lives of people, an ordinary thing, an everyday thing, but with a bit or quite a lot of magic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gillian. That was uh, great and really interesting to hear. Uh, I feel like I, uh, you're talking about this kind of music part of your childhood and the things I, I could really relate to growing up in Sweden in the 1980s and 90s, where we still had a very supportive local music thing that funneled mm -hmm. you in as a young person getting out. So it's very interesting yeah. to hear. Uh, so I think we can take about 10 minutes of, uh, of questions and then if we have time at the end of this week we'll come back and we can combine discussions from all three presentations. So is there anyone, would anyone like to start with a question? Please, if you can use your hands up thing uh, on, on uh, the Zoom thing or just yell out and I, I will let you speak. Hey, well, should I throw you one then? Yeah. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I thought it was very interesting we were talking about the Arts Council, the Foundation of the Arts Council, and also to kind of turn towards focus on professionalism uh, within, within this, with the funding. But I wonder, I mean, how do you see today, what is the chances of, of councils, local organizations, to actually be able to make a point of, of spending money on music and a kind of local mm. level to build up that grassroots situation, even if most major funding might still be going to professionals? Well, I think in a sense, my point, um, I mean, if I, a longer, more in-depth presentation, I, I might have unpacked that a bit more, but I think um, in a sense, my point was, about um, the fact that you know the bulk of money has gone since the since the Arts Council was founded um, towards professional musicians who then um, organisations who then I mean it was only really in the eighties when I started I'm I. Um, in the 1980s, I started at the London Sinfonietta as the first ever education person for, it was called education in those days, for an orchestra. In fact, it meant we worked a lot, a huge amount in schools, we worked in prisons, we worked um, in other communities with um, older people, um, in um, day centres and all sorts of um, community settings. Um, but it was kind of almost, it was optional um, and it was um, um, it became more, I mean, it's become more of a condition of funding that people do get involved in some way. Um, but it's, again, there's, there's not any sort of coordination about it. It's not, it's still kind of up to the, or get the professional organizations which are funded. So I think part that, you know, as we well know at the moment, good grief, there's, there's not gonna be more money for anything. Um, but, um, I guess what I'm arguing about is that we, well, two things in terms of funding, um, and I'd be really interested to see what in reality, and we'll find out next week, 
what in reality is the 26th of October is the is the decision date, the announcement date for the for the grants for the you know the big grants for the arts council organisations, including this place, including the Royal Opera, including the small you know the smaller organisations. But so those it would be interesting to see how this new strategy plays out, which does seem to shift the balance towards this creative community thing. But I also think um, it's and this is what I was talking to the Amsterdam um, teachers about was that. Um, it is, I would say, vital that we never teach, that we don't teach um, young musicians coming into the profession, um, that they don't have an obligation to be part of a community, that, that they won't be enriched by being part of that. And, and we know, and it's been said to me, and it was said to me by people in Amsterdam, it's said to me by people in conservatoires and sometimes universities in this country, um, that there is a bit of a feeling still, you know, 40 years nearly after I started working at the London Symphony Etta, that doing um, work in communities or education work as part of your work in, the, in an orchestra is not the, the front, right, front rank work. This is what, um, this is something extra and it's sometimes things that um, people who are not, you know, the top level musicians do. So by giving those examples of inspiring people like, Nikki Benedetti, Marin Olsop, Chichi Monaco. I was able to, sh you know, I was hoping to show people arguing that, um, that there are, you know, those musicians of and Benjamin Britten, you know, and and Gustav Holst of enormous standing and um, view this is absolutely part of who they are as an artist. Um, and the other thing, oh, excuse me, I was going to, oh, yeah, I mean, just another example of that recently was I was speaking with some musicians in a in an orchestra in a major city and you know post-covid like many um classical music organizations particularly and also other live events theaters etc um they're all worried about their audiences coming back and again my argument is about um yes you're still doing your concerts but think about all the other things you can think about all the people that you're not reaching through doing these big these city centre concerts every Saturday night. And what else can it, where else can the orchestra be? Um, and one of the players is very perceptive said, actually, yes, you know, we used to be the pin because I was talking about this active society, which in a sense, which is much weaker, active musical society, much weaker um, now because of all the, the cuts in education, because of and also these other structures that I talked about, amateur um, music making, um, although there's some encouraging things, as I said, about choirs, etc. Um, but he said, yes, we used to be the pinnacle of a of a pyramid, but now the pyramid's gone and we're just there and we'll collapse if we're not. So I thought that was, I mean, perhaps he wouldn't put it that way, but it was an interesting um, comment that this tuba player made. Well, thank you very much, Gillian. Uh, if we have anyone else for a question, otherwise we will move on to our next speaker. And if you something comes up in your mind later on, we'll, we'll do a a call at the yeah. end as well. Thank you so much, Gillian. And uh, yes, so uh, Jenny Henley, uh, oh, no, see, are you there? <laughs> uh, oh, hello, Sam, you're here as well, excellent. So uh, Jenny, are you happy to, 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 to do yours now? So sorry, Sam, we're all a bit delayed because of some tech issues at the start, but I hope that's okay. Yes. Yeah. So excellent. So uh, Jenny, she is the director of programs and professor of music education at the Royal Northern College of Music in Manchester. And she oversees all undergraduate, postgraduate and junior programs of study and has responsibility for access and participation. Her research explores the relationship between pedagogy and inclusion. And today she's going to tell us about uh, some of the things from a research project that she calls Redefining Excellence and Inclusion solution uh, and uh, look at the relation to exploring the barriers to music education. I hope that was, was close enough. Thank you very much, Jenny. I'm going to disappear in the background and I look forward to listen to your presentation. Lovely. Thank you. I'm going to do the uh, the share screen thing. So I have a mentee um, that, uh, let's just stick it up on there. There we go. So I'm, I've I've mainly got flat slides, but I've got a couple of slides that require 
audience participation. So this is a top tip to see if your students are still there when you're teaching on Zoom. <laughs> um, so if you uh, want to, uh, th there should be a code at the top of the screen. I've written it down because my bar is covering it. So if you go to menti.com and put in the code 24009850, you can um, participate in the Menti. So yeah, um, thanks very much for the introduction. Um, my, my professional background is in music education. So I taught the flute for many years, um, taught classroom music, uh, worked in teacher education, um, directed youth and amateur ensembles. And so my the past 15 years, I've been researching the relationship between pedagogy and inclusion. I can see somebody's on the Menti because you've given me a thumbs up and a love heart. Thank you very much. Um, and and uh, I didn't set out to uh, research the relationship between pedagogy and inclusion. I actually started my research journey looking at deep learning processes that were occurring within adult ensembles that have been set up specifically for opportunities for adults who didn't have the opportunity to learn an instrument as a child. And this took me on a research journey that has involved a, a, a body of work in music and prisons and in teacher education and all sorts of things. And so here I am today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk briefly about two research projects um, and I'm going to contextualize this in the current uh, policy landscape to hopefully leave uh, you with a provocation. So uh, the first research project, oh no, no, before I do that, it's the audience participation. Um, what I want to do before I start is just to gather your thoughts on your uh, uh, responses to these two concepts, inclusion, first of all. So you should be able to enter something on the mentee. So just put a couple of words to what you think inclusion is. What does it mean to you? We're going to come back to these at the end. Lovely. Good. So you should see them all popping up on screen here. So allowing everybody to contribute and participate in society. Lovely. Uh, not only present, but develop a feeling of belonging. Belonging, that's a real key word, isn't it? And belonging, because we've just incorporated belonging into our EDI policy. So we now have a, a, a BD policy, belonging, uh, equality, diversion and inclusion, no age limit. Absolutely. Oh, my thing's in the way. I can't read that. Easy access and will participate for a diversity of, of opportunity. Great. Lovely. Looking beyond the regular faces. Nice. Wonderful. I find this really interesting. Every um, thing that I've done relating to uh, inclusion, I I start this way to just kind of gather everybody's thoughts together. Um, also excluding some people. That's interesting. That came up in our research projects. Maybe I probably won't have time to touch on that, but maybe I will if I do. Great. So if this is inclusion, what I'm going to move to the next slide. What is excellence? What do we think excellence is? Now, the reason that I've used inclusion and excellence in this presentation is because these were the concepts that we used in the research uh, project um, at the time. Uh, so 2017, I think we started the research project. It's a project with my um, research partner, uh, Professor Lee Higgins from the um, uh, International Centre for Community Music at York St John. These were the two words that we could see everywhere. We could see them on marketing material for commercial music applications. <laughs> um, we saw them um, uh, on uh, in evaluation reports. So we wanted to really interrogate these words to see what they meant. Okay, you. Oh, interesting. Uh, excellence for whom? Great question. Dependent on context. Absolutely. Uh, not so easy, is it, to articulate this as it is to articulate inclusion? Great. A subjective analysis of distance travelled. Subjective, that's really interesting, depending on who's judging. It's a really key point, isn't it, that it depends on who, um, on, on who it's for and who it's about. Okay, 
Great, lovely. So the research project, the first project that I'm going to just really briefly share was the Muse Up project. So there's a website there. I did this when I was down at the Royal College of Music um, and the resources are still there that you can access. They're publicly available. There's recordings of the events and all sorts of things. Um, and if, if you're interested in the project and how it worked, uh, we, uh, Lee and I um, edited a special issue of the uh, International Journal of Community Music. And the, the first um, article explains the project and that's open access. And this article here, which I'm gonna talk about now, that is open access as well. So you can, you can have a look at that. But what we did is we wanted to interrogate these two concepts. We brought together a group of people from different fields, music education, community music, but also psychology, criminology, music therapy, uh, practitioners, as well as researchers to really try and understand what people People meant by these two concepts and how they related to the work that we were all doing. Now, it wasn't a data collection project. We didn't collect data, but what we did do is we had a series of discussions, debates, um, and again, the materials are there on that website. You can see them if you're interested. Um, and Lee and I um, analysed it. We, we looked at the discourses that were coming through, and we found that there were five main discourses um, that the discussions related to. So there were discussions about value, about context. So these are some of the things that came up in your um, uh, disc uh, descriptions of excellence, uh, measurement, process, product, and pedagogy. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to I'm going to pick one point from each of those because I don't have time to go through them all, but they're all in that paper if you're interested. Um, so value first of all so there's a few bullet points here that are outlined in in the paper and what i wanted to pick up on here was again really interesting that this is in line with the comments that, that you made on the menti screen earlier is this idea that values of excellence do not transfer really really interesting there was some quite lively debate about the the different um uh, the different value that different people working in in different genres and different act types of activity place on excellence. But th there was a really interesting tension here. There was a contradiction because people argued quite um, assertively that their genre of music that they were working in was universally inclusive. So there was something really interesting here about the universality of inclusion that, that people were claiming that they were working in a certain type of music and this is accessible to everybody, yet the values of excellence are very exclusive, if you like, to the particular type of activity um, that that was was taking place. So this to me is really, really fascinating going to move on to the next uh, discourse. Again, all of these are outlined in the paper. So pedagogy, something that, that fascinates me throughout all of these debates that we have is how people um, talk about pedagogy. And I think there's a real misunderstanding of inclusive practice that cause, that's caused by people focusing on the content of, of what we teach. And of course, we need to look at the content and the curriculum. That's really, really important. But actually, if we don't think about how it's being taught, then we're really not thinking about inclusion. The definition of pedagogy that I use in my work is taken from Gage. So, uh, and pedagogy means different things in different places. Um, so Gage's definition is that pedagogy is uh, nomothetic knowledge, the, the, uh, the knowledge that we have of strategies, teaching strategies that we know work, gen work in general, crucially as applied to the individual people or groups of people that we're working with. And the idiosyncratic knowledge of those people is fundamental. Pedagogy is about relationships between people. So inclusive pedagogy is about how you're working with people. You can use, you know, I've seen pr practice that has been labeled as inclusive because it's using a particular type of material, but it's done in a very exclusionary type of way. OK, moving on swiftly, power. There were some really interesting discussions about power relations that ran through all of our MUSOC debates. And the, the point that I wanted to draw out here is this um, idea of the inequality of relationships. So power, there, there's always some kind of power relationship, particularly in any educational 
um, uh, relationship. So when I enter a room as a teacher, there's a certain inequality in the relationship between me and my students. But I need to acknowledge that and acknowledging those power relationships are really important. There's power relationships that exist throughout organisations, um, between individuals, between organisations. But we really have got to acknowledge that if we're ever going to think about trying to uh, uh, move on and also acknowledge our responsibilities um, in those power relationships. And then process product, there's something really interesting here that the kind of assumption that's, that is quite often made that I've heard people make is that excellence is about the product and inclusion is about the process. But actually what came through our debate is that was seen as the other way around. Really, really interesting. Um, and so the idea that excellence is very much about a process um, and perhaps the product of that process is inclusionary practice. Um, and then the final um, set of discourses uh, is measurement. So this, the, the, the whole um, idea that you, you've always got to measure the impact of your work creates quite a tension for any kind of work that is um, aimed at um, uh, working in an inclusionary way. And one of the points that I'll, the point I want to draw out here is this idea um, that actually many of the outcomes are unseen or won't be seen for a long time. And it's really, really difficult to try and measure those. But our future funding is contingent on us having positive measurement, positive evaluations uh, of the things that we do. And this is a very lively debate in community music, particularly at the moment, that the um, uh, the issue of evaluation has been skewed towards the positive because we know and, you know, I, I've worked as a value, an evaluator and I know that that organisation needs that positive evaluation in order to get more money to do the work that they need to do with the kids that they want to do it with. It's, it's a really difficult, it's a real conundrum um, from a research perspective. So those are um, the uh, flavour of the discourses and some of the uh, sort of contradictions that, that existed within the debates when we we're talking about these two concepts. And at the end of this project and at the end of this paper, Lee and I suggested that we need to redefine excellence inclusion. We kind of put to the, com the research community what would happen if we turn these things around and we thought about excellence as being the process by which we achieve inclusion. But I'm just going to fast forward to today to, to think about this a little bit more. So the policy context that we're in, really, really interesting um, to hear from Gillian uh, about the Arts Council and the, the, that, that history of the Arts Council and the way the Arts Council is moving forward. There's a very, very interesting alignment of policy happening at the moment. So in higher education, access and participation is changing direction. Um, and this has been coming on for a year or so now, and we've got to rewrite our access and participation plans next year. There's a real focus on raising attainment in schools. Um, education policy is steering um, education towards the idea of multi-academy trusts, sorry, access and participation as an emphasis on working with multi-academy trusts. Um, in education policy, schools are being steered towards being part of multi-academy trusts, sharing resources. There's some key risks here for music education, um, uh, which perhaps I can go into if anybody's interested. Um, music education policy is repositioning hubs, schools and higher education and bringing in this journey towards being a professional musician and involving higher education in the National Plan for Music Education changes the game completely. There's an emphasis throughout music education, the, the National Club of Music Education on multi-academy trusts, which is really interesting. Um, and then cultural policy, which uh, Gillian has talked about, is really challenging arts organisations um, about these issues of quality and inclusion and this move to encompassing, you know, community elements uh, in their work. 
So there's some real key opportunities in this policy alignment. There's a window of opportunity for us to work in, but some very, very um, clear risks to that as well. And this is where I'm going to bring in um, the second research project. Uh, so this, the second research project I'm going to refer, refer to uh, was the Music Commission research. So the Music Commission was a panel of people from across the music industry, music education, some research, um, uh, music education research representation there. Um, it was put together, funded by the Arts Council to try and, and sort of I guess, untangle the issues of progression in music education. Um, and there's a the article that you can see on there. This also is open access, so you can you can read this uh, article. Uh, we published uh, some of the findings from the Music Commission. We haven't published all of them yet. This was finished just before the pandemic. So we sort of like had a bit of time before um, before publishing it. Now, in this research project, what we did was we did a, um, a, a piece of empirical research. There was 727 research participants, I think, which was quite a small research study to, to, to have a look at uh, barriers to music and music education. But then what we did is we clarified that against a rapid evidence assessment that was a wider body of research. And that rapid evidence assessment involved around 10,000 research participants. So we took the findings from the smaller research study, applied them to the larger body of research, and then drew out the themes that were in common in both. And these were the themes that came up here. So you can see that there's, there's, there's a direct relationship between some of these themes and the things that came out of the music project, value, obviously. Um, collaboration, there's some real synergies with collaboration um, as well, um, although not explicitly, but the um, a lot of the things that came through the discourses in the music project was this um, idea that if different people value different things, how can we collaborate? Um, and then the there were some really interesting things about barriers to collaboration that link to the power discussion as well. When you've got a larger organisation collaborating with a smaller organisation, that can be, be a very difficult relationship, for example. Um, now, um, shall I say about, yes, I'm going to say two things about funding, I think. So funding ran all the way through uh, the themes um, and we highlighted it as a separate theme as well. But Two things that I'll say about that. Firstly, I quite often hear people saying, oh, we need to go back to the time where uh, instrumental lessons are free. Uh, people go back to this golden age, don't they, of when lessons were free and, and you know, everybody could participate and, and that would enable them to progress. But we've seemed to forget that that was selective. So it was free, but it was selective. So music services had an allocation of free places and that wasn't equitable either. Some music services had a lot of funding for free places and other music services only had a small amount of funding for free places. And then kids were tested for their musical aptitude to decide whether they got a free place or not to learn their instrument. Now, um, the types of tests that we used were contingent on prior knowledge. So Bentley testing, for example, kind of similar to, you know, graded exam oral tests, you know, here's a little phrase, sing it back to me. We know from teaching kids to do those exams, they need to learn how to do that. So um, I sang in a church choir, so that was something that I could do. So I passed my test and got my flute lessons, whereas other people have never done that before. So they didn't pass the test and they didn't get their free flute lessons. So we have to be really careful when we think about, you know, the, the idea of, of free lessons. There's a lot of things that have to be worked out um, in order for that to be uh, something that, that can work for all kids. The other thing about funding is the policy uh, landscape over the past, oh, since the 1988 Education Act, I guess, has created a commercial landscape for music education. You look at the new National Plan for Music Education and it says very, very clearly that funding will be given to music clubs, but that funding needs to be used for them to generate other sources of funding in order to run their activity. Um, and we're all 
fighting for a bite of the same cherry of funding and that's very very problematic there's commercial music education organizations coming in selling themselves uh, to schools as much as the public funding organizations now all of these themes here and the point that we make in the article time for change nothing's new these are the same barriers that have existed for after 20 you know, after 20 years of policy policy initiatives they're exactly the same barriers so i looked back to 2002 which is when wider opportunities were introduced and looking at the documentation as to why they were introduced it was to overcome all of these barriers that we can see here there's been constant evaluation and research over the past 20 years evaluating all of these different policy initiatives and schemes and the same barriers can come up. And also these barriers are traced back in research prior to 2002. So nothing has changed. This is the point that I make in the article, you know, the Music Commission, I think were very disappointed to see that we hadn't uncovered the, the great answer to what the key barrier to music education was. But as a researcher, I was really, I was really intrigued by this. So what is it? What are we doing that has created no change? All that public funding, all that energy and all that effort and those barriers still exist. Now, in the new National Plan for Music Education, there's a section called, uh, what's it called now? Building pa Talent Pathways. Um, and it articulates the various different you know, pathways that young people can take to, to get into the profession. And th all this research shows all the barriers that young people will have to those particular pathways. So I'm getting towards my provocation here. <laughs> um, you'll be pleased to know I'm coming to the end. This is, this is a real conundrum, right? So out of both these research projects, what is fascinating to me is a, there emerges a real blame culture in the data. Um, and people are, are not shy of forthcoming of uh, saying who, which organisations they feel are the cause of the inequalities in music education. It's really interesting. Some of the data I can't publish because, um, well, because it would be unethical too. Um, but there's some, a lot of strong feeling as to who is responsible. Um, and that to me is interesting that we get this blame culture coming through. So in the MUSEUP project, the end of that project, we called for this redefinition of these concepts of inclusion and excellence in order to help us move forward. But the Music Commission research is, is showing that, you know, clearly it doesn't really matter how we define inclusion and how we define excellence, that these barriers are still existing, you know, after all of these different policy initiatives. The policy context has created some opportunities, um, uh, some really good opportunities, actually, but there are some there, there's some key risks uh, around that. And there's also other agendas going on there in the policy initiatives as well. That's that multi academy trust uh, connection is really interesting. That's probably a discussion for a different conference so i'm wondering whether we're in a bit of a catch-22 situation whether we're in a bit of a strange loop and so i guess my provocation is what are we going to do that's different we can re-churn out the same types of projects we can have the same discussions but if nothing changes then we've got to do something different i think i'll leave that there Thank you very much, uh, uh, Jenny. That was really interesting. So, any questions from, questions from the floor, questions from the screen, maybe in this case? <laughs> oh, uh, Laudan, please unmute yourself. And, and Sorry, I'm going to keep my video off if that's okay. Jenny, thank you so much. Really, really interesting. Um, I guess my question is, I'm not entirely clear when you say nothing has changed. I mean, some things presumably must have changed. So I'd be interesting to know the kind of nuances of that. But also, what is the you know what does success look like? 
what is it what is it obviously we're not aiming just to churn out lots and lots of professional musicians this is a much broader thing than that so you know what is yeah what does success look like and and what is it exactly that we're aiming for um in terms of successful change if you like yeah interesting two really really good questions there um nothing's changed well, of course, some things have changed and some different people have had opportunities that they might not necessarily have had. The, the one real key thing for me is, that, that came through the research, the reason I say nothing has changed is because the, the themes are absolutely the same. I mean, when, when I'm looking through the data and then when I, you know, I was going back and doing literature reviews and I was looking at things that were written 10, 15 years ago, it's exactly the same kind of things, location, geography, public transport being a real barrier, um, you, you know, being in a city, great, but if you're not, then that's a real problem. Um, so it's it's those kind of things that, you know, we, we still haven't work, really, really worked out how we're going to kind of, um, you know, a, a address some of those fundamental things. But the, the real thing that I find is quite interesting is we're really great at doing the initial stuff, right? So there's been some fantastic, and there is, amazing work um you know doing those initial experiences but it's that transition and this this has been a problem in in education this is a problem in education across the board not just in music education but you know what happens when you need to get to the next step there's there's um um i didn't have enough time to put all these things on the slides now but there's some really heartbreaking quotes by young people in the research music commission research we we had young people contribute to that research but there's some you know heartbreaking kind of comments about well the thing is it's free for three years isn't it but then they know that they're not going to be able to go any yes. further you know and 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 so it's it's these things that we've got to really work out and you know my experience of obviously we're all trying to get funding to do the great stuff that we want to do nobody wants to fund the boring bit in the middle which is the most important part actually everybody wants to fund the initial stuff and getting like 100 kids in a room etc but actually the bit that the kids really need to take them from A to B, wherever B is, because, you know, for your second question, I would I would say, well, who's we? Because success is different for different people, isn't it? And that that is the whole that's the whole point, I guess. Um, interesting with access and participation, the way that's changed and kind of quite emancipates our work, certainly, is it's no longer about recruitment to your own institution that that's quite a small change but really significant so actually that releases me so I can do the work that I want to do for music education regardless of where kids are going to go rather than have to focus that work on on coming into uh, our college um but you know the, these are the things we we've got to be discussing haven't we what what does success look like and acknowledge that it does look differently for different people and so trying to all do the same thing is not necessarily going to work don't know if that answered your question yeah thank you can i just respond quickly that thank you for so much for all of that and of course yeah you're absolutely right so you know it's not just enough to throw money at lessons you know kids need somewhere to practice they may need parents to take them to lessons you need strings and reeds and music and all of that and of course that's those are all barriers for, for many people um exactly. but yeah thank you i, I mean it'd be interesting in terms of access to higher education you may be aware that Edims has been working uh, Anna Bull and her team have been working on a report which is will hopefully be out quite soon unfortunately we only had access to HESA data for I think it was 2017 to 2020 or something like that but even within those three years it's quite interesting to look at the demographic patterns um, and I don't know whether anyone has actually done research in terms of changing demographics for higher education that goes back further than that um but yes just just to kind of mention the the edims report that, that i think is going to be out very very soon um obviously that's specifically about access to higher education but obviously some of some of the same issues thanks jenny yeah. thank you so yeah gillian you wanted to add something to to jenny's comments there as well thank you yes Thank you, Jenny. That was really interesting. Just, uh, just sort of on Laudan's quite the part of Laudan, your question, Laudan, about you know sh where where are we going? Surely it's not just about um, producing more and more professional musicians. I guess that links in, um, and pardon me for being perhaps 
a bit imprecise and unacademic because I'm not an academic, obviously, like um, you guys are. But just the, the my, I think it links in with my point about you know this ideal world of of um, everybody feeling that they're able to be involved in music if they want to be, and that you know an active musical society at whatever level. Um, and I think that that is the that's this kind of <laughs> perhaps utopian, but and and I don't wish to be backward looking, but what would be a contemporary and future version of that? Of what I would, you know, what I would argue, um, classical music particularly um, was built on. If you, I'm thinking about Brahms. I often cite this Brahms when he was writing his symphonies for performance. He was churning them out even before they reached the concert hall. Um, in forehand piano versions and you know people in the audience would be active music makers and of course there are many many different versions of that that's a very particular time in a very particular place but this idea that people can make music at whatever level and um, just like you can read a book um, at, at whatever you know you can you can read a book or you can um, play sport all things that you take part in in your education um, but you're not necessarily doing it in a professional capacity for pleasure and for leisure and to and for all the other benefits um, that we know come and flow from participation in the arts and culture. Can, can I add something there? That's it, it, it's absolutely right, isn't it? And you know, a, a lot of my professional life before going into academia was absolutely working with with adults and, and amateurs and kids and at all sorts of levels. And, and I think that there is a real general understanding that, that that is the place where we want to be, where everybody can participate in. Again, this is where the policy context comes in because the, the way higher education is being pushed is towards employability. The way schools are being pushed is towards employability. That, so this is what I meant by there's some other agendas here in the aligning of policy. Mm. Um, and we're, we're measured, all institutions are measured on their, their outcomes and where their graduates are going. Um, and of course, you know, and it was the same when I was uh, down at college, one of the biggest um, employment uh, activities of of our graduates is teaching you know and, and they're going into those teaching roles there was a real pandemic shift as well where professional musicians lost all their playing work they suddenly realized the value of their teaching work because that's what sustained their income you know during that period and th th there has been a very interesting shift actually about thinking about the place of teaching because it, it is through this work and facilitation and leading that you're going to reach that that kind of thing what's very interesting is that the, the, there's so many you know there's different sectors here aren't there that need to work together to, to create this understanding um, and that's in itself is very problematic isn't it so the higher education sector we're being driven by the employability agenda we're be, there's a whole load of stuff going on about low value courses of which the arts are usually you know classed as one yet the cultural sector is all about sort of bringing out you know sort of bringing these to the fore and creating you know environments where everybody can participate and it's it's the 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 policy might seem to be aligning, but actually there's, there, there are some real tensions there that make it very difficult. So in my role, I have to write strategy for our institution. So I'm constantly trying to balance these policies to get the strategy right, to do what we need to do to, you know, to, to enable our, our students to be successful at whatever they're going to be, you know, in whatever area of music making they're working in. Sorry, that was a bit of a rant. <laughs> <laughs> uh, run things aloud. Thank you very much, Jenny and everyone. Uh, so I think we need to move on now. Uh, and uh, so last but not least, uh, we got uh, Sam Murray, uh, who is an early career researcher and lecturer in music business and arts management at Mid Middlesex University, London. Uh, in addition to his work in higher education, he has a background in cultural policy research, working with UK Music and Creative Cardiff, among others. And his presentation today will be about creating a revalidation framework for diversity, environmental sustainability, new technology and employability in the music business curriculum. So let's see, are you, yep, yeah, you got it, got the presentation up. Thank you. It's all working. All Good. can be seen. Go. 
Good, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for inviting me to talk. Uh, the, the research and uh, the, the thoughts that I'm presenting today were done uh, also with my colleague, Julia Hafferkorn, who apologises she can't actually make today's session, so I'm kind of presenting work from, from both of us. Uh, and really what I wanted to share was just some experiences that we'd had in using revalidation as a way to open up conversations about inclusion and diversity uh, within our music, particular music business course we run here at Middlesex. So what I'm going to do is just kind of share some of our thinking through the revalidation process, um, and then also share some of the specific academic interventions we designed uh, to be more inclusive in, in practice as well. So uh, yeah, just to give you a bit of background about the process uh, of revalidation we kind of went through. Uh, so this is all about the BA Music Business and Arts Management course we do here at Middlesex. Middlesex University is a post-92 uh, for Polytechnic. Uh, and what's really interesting is we not only have quite a lot of international students, but quite a lot of students who were the first ever in their family to go to a university. Uh, and that's something we take a lot of pride in as an institution. Um, this particular course came up for revalidation in 2021. And as part of the process, Julia and I were trying to advocate quite vociferously to make sure that we were having conversations not only about how curriculum can be designed but how we can really ensure that a four core themes were at the center of our practice and we felt these themes kind of really interconnected so first of all it's about diversity and i'll go into a bit what i mean by that uh, we also wanted to look at sustainability in the environment, technological developments, employability, and to see how these things all interact with each other. Uh, and whilst I'm not going to go into too much detail on the other sections, um, today we very much see diversity as a strand that goes throughout all of them uh, as well. So uh, as part of this process, we introduced new modules, we kind of reshaped the way the programme was delivered, and we really wanted to respond to various needs that students had. And we used this process, as I mentioned, as an impetus to, to try and create a new framework. Uh, we created a framework built specifically around these themes. Um, so our starting point for this was basically coming up with some really, really quick, straightforward actions that we could do. So, uh, for example, considering these, these are the action points we put on the document for uh, our colleagues to consider when writing, for example, module narratives, which is looking at who and what is represented in reading lists, and if necessary, kind of adding works and changing works as part of that. Uh, looking at how you can include case studies of what uh, in society are underrepresented groups, but actually amongst our student population are, are quite majority groups. Um, also looking at referring students to kind of industry sources and interest groups uh, that they can connect with, uh, inviting guest speakers who kind of intersected with the core themes and represented a variety of different backgrounds. Uh, also thinking about how we set assessment tasks. So could we give uh, more optionality in the kinds of assessments that we're offering people? So those who may have very uh, practical skills, being able to demonstrate that as, alongside more traditional formats of kind of uh, presentations or essays. Then also thinking about how we can make sure that the themes that we discussed could have a central place within modules and become a specific lecture in themselves. Uh, and then also to include uh, one or more of those four core themes within learning outcomes as well. So that was kind of our starting point for this process, just to say, right, here's a list of really, really easy actions that we could just get done. Um, so we changed all of our reading lists and updated them. We made sure that we had a kind of repository of different case studies that colleagues could interact with. And we created a document where we gave some prominent case studies um, for all of those different themes. Uh, and we also encouraged uh, and have been monitoring the guest speaker invitations that we've had. So I'm, I, I wasn't actually aware that the Eden's report hasn't been published. So so apologies uh, if I'm if I'm giving away kind of secrets and stuff. Uh, I was I was at a presentation of the Eden's report at the IASPM UK conference recently. So I kind of took some notes and thought I'd make some responses to that. But it certainly was a really valuable report to engage with, uh, and I've not included any of the kind of headline statistics here, and I'll, I'll allow that to be published when it is. But immediately, as soon as we kind of interacted with the data on the report, we started to have a bit of reflections as a staff team. Um, part of a big part of the process is myself and other academics uh, personally identify as LGBTIQA+. Um, and we wanted to uh, acknowledge that the fact that the Eden's report may have some gaps in kind of knowledge around that and see how we could contribute the knowledge that we have 
from having LGBTIQA plus staff and also uh, students in our community uh, and how we may be able to contribute some of the data that we have to those discussions. Uh, also about recognising the importance as well uh, of discussing class, uh, really recognising, as I mentioned, that most students are the first in their generation uh, to go to university and often come from what would be considered working class backgrounds and making sure that we have the kind of right support mechanisms in place, but also potentially sharing our knowledge and sharing our best practice to provide kind of case studies and data to contribute to the work that, that EDIMS is doing. Um, also a need for us as well to collect more data on protective characteristics and particularly how they're mapped across different levels of study. We do have kind of rudimentary data, but we haven't actually been collecting data amongst the staff team ourselves to be able to look more cohesively at our recruitment strategies and how they might respond to the varying levels. Um, in terms of our, our diversity of protected characteristics, we actually have some quite good statistics. Unfortunately, I'm not allowed to share them due to data protection, um, but actually on quite a lot of uh, protected characteristics, we have more than the national average in terms of percentages, but it's still really important that we have a look at this uh, across levels of study and see if it's translating, for example, to undergraduate, to master's and master's to PhD. Um, but also we recognise that there are ongoing issues around staffing and employment, uh, certainly within our department and across the university to make sure that staffing is considering a better diversity. Uh, and also there is a need for more institutional accountability, we felt, around EDI. Um, and one of the things myself and Julia both <laughs> have experienced before is that quite often staff with protected characteristics are expected to do the labour around those particular uh, issues rather than it uh, being discussed more widely. So we wanted to kind of respond to that and say that we want to take these things into account. So we decided to have a look and a bit of a breakdown as to what our understanding of diversity was. And this is by no means uh, the, the definition uh, as such, but we wanted to give a sense of what kind of things were included in our discussions, other things were as well. And I'm sure we could have a long debate about what the word means and what it should include. But we, we felt it was really interesting to have discussions around, for example, diversity of opinion, particularly considering a lot of uh, uh, guidance coming out of the office for students indicating that uh, universities are not bastions of free speech and a lot of media that is going around uh, about this when obviously we find on the ground this is certainly not the case. I have students from many different political opinions and backgrounds often arguing with each other about that. But seeing how we could respond to Office for Student Guidance, how we could look at diversity of representation backgrounds and, and also viewpoints. But we really wanted to ensure that, uh, you know, myself and Julia being people with protected characteristics, we were really passionate about ensuring representation throughout modules and having visibility. Uh, the power of visibility is so, so important to be able to see people who are like you being successful in an industry can just have such a wonderful impact. And also identifying and meeting specific needs that are raised by those who uh, are from what you might call marginalized communities, although other terms and definitions are available. Um, in terms of the work, we kind of got a guide to some of the key scholars that, that we drew on, looking at Vic Bain's work about uh, gender of the music industries, Joy White's work on black entrepreneurship, Freya Jarman's work on LGBTIQA plus issues, looking at the work of Blake Howe, uh, and also Jensen Moulton Lerner and Strauss on disability as well. So we really wanted to make sure we were engaging with literature as part of this process to make sure we could see what discussions were happening in the wider industry that would impact how we would teach um, our particular students. We also had a really interesting discussion recently about LGBTIQA plus visibility, and I'm raising this in particular because I know that the uh, Adams report perhaps has a little bit of a gap on some of the data around this, uh, which is completely understandable. Uh, but we wanted to explore this particular issue because of quite a few of our staff do identify as LGBTIQA plus, and we wanted to have a discussion about staff being role models to students to show that they can achieve things regardless of their background. Uh, and some of us have presented, for example, LGBTIQA plus oriented research. So myself, for example, I presented at the International Bisexuality Conference and then bought some of the research I'd done about my own practice and how my bisexuality interacts with that back into the classroom so that students can in engage with some of that material as well. And then also thinking about how we can create an environment to be comfortable in being visible if so wished and how we could support colleagues who wanted to demonstrate that visibility. Uh, and part of this was inspired by work of authors such as uh, I've drawn on the work of Dr. Julia Shaw, who really talks about the power of bisexual visibility uh, within performing spaces, but also uh, within media as well, and how this can create kind of role models. 
We also had a discussion uh, and have been thinking a lot about how we can support our students. Uh, so very much our, our basis of building support is very much around compassion for varying situations that students are in. Many of our students come from uh, backgrounds where they face a lot of challenges in their home lives. Uh, we wanted to be able to find ways uh, to offer support, but sometimes that might include going around kind of protocols <laughs> and systems that exist. I probably shouldn't go into too much detail as I'm in my department and don't want bosses to hear it, but often we'll find ways to go around to make things supporting. But we've often found that quite a lot of what we need to be able to achieve to best support our students comes into conflict with government policy. Uh, and a really recent example of this was uh, in the summer. Some of you may have read this already, but Michelle Donnellan sent around an email saying that teaching basically had to be in person, that online teaching was a bad thing, unless it was particularly a distance learning course and that hybrid uh, learning, essentially it was being implied, doesn't have a space anymore. But quite often we may have uh, students who uh, have children, have childcare issues, we may have students who are carers, who sometimes for uh, various reasons cannot access uh, learning in person. And it felt in a way that because of this particular policy, we may be cutting off access for students to their learning, when actually it was suiting them having that kind of hybrid model when they could come into the classroom when they could, or uh, watch it online and interact online uh, as well. Also, what we've really recognised, as I'm sure many of you have, is that finance is a really strong issue that is becoming harder and harder and harder to resolve. I've had several students this year who have not been able to continue the course because uh, they're international students who can't get funding. Um, also, as well, just the cost of living has put off a lot of people even applying to university because they're worried about all these additional costs. And in my third year class the other day, I was asking them, you know, who actually does a part time job to support their university studies. Uh, and in a, in a class of about 30, every single student put their hand up. They're all doing uh, second jobs to be able to support them being in university and to be able to support living costs around it. So that is a big challenge and we need to look at how we can better support students through that. But we're seeing that finance is a growing issue that is becoming harder and harder to resolve, certainly for academics like ourselves who don't have the power to kind of grant that. So I just want to share with you now just a couple of interventions that, that we've engaged with and we've designed uh, to kind of allow students expressions of identity, expressions of diversity. And the first one I wanted to share was uh, a, a module that we have where we do a flipped classroom model. And this module, which is about critical thinking in music, uh, has a really simple process where a student will prepare a topic of their choice and lead a seminar on the topic of that choice. Uh, they will provide us with an explanation of the topic with key questions and will provide at least kind of free sources uh, that they have connected to it. So students are given the chance to choose whatever topic that they want, but in uh, giving them the kind of scaffolding and building of what they can look at. We really encourage students who feel they want to talk about issues uh, around maybe something to do with their own protected characteristics or something to do with industry issues that they can have the space to explore and discuss with each other. And while the student is presenting this topic um, to the rest of the class, students that are not presenting uh, are asked to give contributions and they're marked for their contributions as well. So they will give contributions considering kind of external factors influencing discussions, contemporary uh, arguments, and also any relevant professional or academic experiences that they've had. So essentially, they're getting get marked for having a dialogue about core issues of the day. And it's become a really, really interesting space in which students have brought topics uh, to it that they want to be able to dissect and unpack with the help of colleagues. So we've had discussions about the treatment of non-English speaking artists in uh, predominantly Western spaces. We've had really interesting sensitive discussions and debates around cultural appropriation. What is it? Well, we've had students of different opinions being able to express um, how they feel about this particular topic. Uh, some students, for example, have brought more specific topics like misappropriation of African-American culture and vernacular in the music industries. We've looked at cancel culture, if it exists and debated that, understanding beauty in the music business and uh, body image issues, as well as looking at those kind of double standards that exist uh, between men and women. And these are very much generated by the students themselves. They'll bring the topic and they'll have that discussion uh, and debate. And it's always done in a really, really respectful way. Uh, and everybody is allowed to kind of 
give their opinion but also respect when people are sharing their personal experiences and it's become also a really nice space for students to be able to listen to each other and actually hear about the experiences they have regarding certain topics and I think a lot of students who come in um, may be surprised at experiences that their peers have had and it allows them to share them and exchange uh, and inform those who may come from more potentially privileged positions to to understand and to be able to act and advocate for change. The next thing that I want to mention is also how we embed uh, kind of notions of diversity within events. So uh, in both first and second year students actually run their own arts and music events and go out and put on different kinds of performances. And we really encourage students to put on performances that kind of have a meaning to them uh, and maybe connect to something that they've encountered or connects to something that they feel best represents their identity. Um, so we really encourage connections, for example, with specific genres that may not be represented, uh, specific communities that may not be represented, and they're, they're given uh, the possibility to put on the live show and essentially be graded for it. Uh, quite a lot of the time we also support this by encouraging them using relevant case studies from different artists of different backgrounds who and showing and demonstrating how they've uh, overcome barriers on putting on live events as well. So uh, the final bit of that is there's also uh, we encourage students to have a link with charities uh, and we had a really successful event last year, for example, where students part of an event about mental health and connected it with the Mind charity. And they used resources from the charity to be able to articulate key issues affecting young people around mental health whilst using the artistic performances as a space to kind of also express those experiences, which is really exciting and really interesting to see. The final intervention that I'm just going to mention is uh, one of our employability kind of interventions. Uh, obviously, we've had the discussion just now about uh, the employability agenda being ever present in higher education. Uh, and whilst it doesn't always have a place, uh, there are some places where we can use this as a way to kind of help uh, address some of the challenges and barriers that exist. And one of the things that we've kind of devised to really help this discussion is to look at different forms of what we call participatory assessment. If you're not familiar with that term, it's basically getting students to be involved in the assessment process and sometimes taking on assessment responsibilities. So this is mostly done through a module we call music entrepreneurship, where students uh, develop an idea for a brand new music related product or service or arts related product or service. Uh, and then the current assignment is to, to pitch that in a video pitch. But the way it was done before previously was that students would develop the idea and they would get scaffolding on how to present the idea, but then they would just submit it. But we thought it would be really interesting to allow students to learn from each other and have uh, a wider sense of all of the different experiences you have in the classroom. You know, of students who come from backgrounds in managing, students who come from backgrounds in performing, who've done recording and engineering, and actually sharing that feedback and getting discussion going has been really, really interesting and allows them to uh, learn new ideas and new approaches. So we started off uh, by asking students to have kind of discussions with peers within group discussions where they would talk about each other's ideas and give feedback. But we are hoping to move to this little diagram that you can see at the bottom, more of a kind of formalized model. And what we'll have kind of students pitching their products and services. And then you may have myself as the marketing lecturer acting as an anchor, but also having students involved in a formative assessment, uh, watching the pitch, it being a kind of replication of what a real life pitch might look like, but then having students uh, sitting alongside me, assessing it from their perspective and offering their opinions. And we've started doing this process and it's been quite interesting already to see how students have engaged with each other. So I had one student who was pitching an idea to create a, a subscription service for ballet shoes because dancers often require them for different levels. And another student said, well, have you thought about the color of the ballet shoes and if they match skin tones or not? Uh, another example was we had a student who was trying to open um, a series of studios uh, and was trying to think about how they could generate extra income for different uses of the space. And then a performer said, well, why don't you also use them as rehearsal spaces? So the students get a chance to interact with each other, share ideas from their very different perspectives uh, and give kind of feedback, almost like a focus group, if you like, of student ideas as well. 
So just a final bit that I'm going to cover is kind of how we are uh, evaluating and monitoring the progress uh, that we've made. And we very much in our department kind of follow ideas around GIMP's reflective cycle as a, as a place to not only reflect on practice, but a chance to reflect on feedback and create actions to take it forward. Uh, what we're really liking about this particular cycle is the place of feeling within it and the fact that feelings can be acknowledged uh, as how we kind of react and respond to events and how they've uncovered. And this has been really, really crucial to not only do reflection in action when we're delivering content, but then also to sit back and review and analyze how uh, these particular uh, academic interventions have unfolded. What we also like is having a very clear kind of action plan at the end, so we can have a clear kind of list of if we're going to do this again, this is what we can change. Uh, we also do a lot of evaluating monitoring through kind of existing feedback hierarchies so we have student voice leaders uh, and regular meetings with them uh, we also have individual tutorials with students in which we go through kind of every single module that they're studying at the moment to get their feedback and then we have end of module kind of feedback forms that we get but I think what we'd really like to move to is a place of uh, having greater accountability within our various structures to ensure that, you know, themes such as diversity and the other themes I've mentioned are actually being worked on and carried through. I'm really keen to see and establish some kind of at least annual review uh, about uh, ensuring that those four core themes are really part of still part of the degree and that those teaching it are drawing on the necessary resources and what we really want to do through this is to demonstrate that there's a clear culture shift from the revalidation that we are listening to some of the feedback we've had from students who are involved in that process and that we are moving on and making a clear commitment to to inclusion and diversity going forward so those were just a few of the thoughts that uh, I wanted to share with you, some of the interventions we've designed, some of our thinking behind it. Um, this is kind of ongoing stuff, so we, we haven't got it quite into a very clear kind of academic journal article form yet, so you'll have to forgive me for being a little bit unstructured in the approach. Uh, but we just wanted to share with you some of the ideas that we've been working on, and then just uh, a quick list of some of the references that we've kind of used to help our sources as well. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Sam. Very interesting to, to hear about your process here of incorporating these things into your music business curriculum. Uh, so we have about uh, 14, 15 minutes here. If anyone have any questions, please uh, give a wave. Otherwise, I'll throw one at you and start. Uh, I, I really liked when you were talking about uh, the pitching aspect and the peer discussions. I mean, I'm always all for peer interventions and peer kind of influencing. And you talked about it to some degree as you're already having quite a diverse group of students and in that way that peer learning could bring up other understandings and thoughts. But it struck me then what Gillian said before about some uh, university music degrees and things like that has an incredibly homogenous group of people, students. And in those cases, if you want the peer kind of involvement to, to, to lead to greater understanding and kind of diversity, it might actually go that way. So have you thought a bit more about, about that when it comes to peer learning? Sorry, could you could you try rephrasing the, the question? I'm not sure I get. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I meant that in okay. your case, when you talk about peer learning and discussion in the pitching here, uh, you have a diverse student group. So you know that the, the peer information and peer kind of help they get will come from a different places. But in other music uh, classes, you might have a very homogenous group. And then this kind of peer work might work very differently and potentially go the other way around. Yeah, no, that's a very, very good point. I mean, obviously, I can only speak from the, the environment in which we've kind of tried and tested it from. Uh, and a lot of this was based on research that was done by Party, Westerland and Liebler that was done, in, I think it was Australia and Finland, where they were looking at how particular courses were delivered. I don't think it was a folk course and a music industry course as well. And what they were doing, there was, they were doing things such as uh, listening panels where a student would play a recording and they get feedback from other students as well. Uh, so, I mean, th there is a potential risk of there being kind of homogenized responses, but of course we're delivering this with full knowledge of who our student kind of body are uh, and how we might respond to that as well. But I think that it's still a useful exercise because of not every single person in the room is going to have the same uh, perspective and ambitions that, that they want to discuss. They may have other forms of opinions that they want to bring in as well. 
Thank you. So Sue Miller, I think you're next. Please unmute yourself. <laughs> Here I am. Hi. It's brilliant to see you, Sam, after 10, 11 years <laughs> since uh, since teaching at Leeds University. And it's great to see all that entrepreneurship still there um, and the enthusiasm for, 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 for um, incorporating that diversity in your teaching. Um, I just kind of want your thoughts on how you deal with the music industry, which is very male dominated, and also the music industry courses in the UK are also led very much by white heterosexual men um, in the main, um, even in my own professional world, um, trying to get a tour at the moment, every single promoter so far for every festival I've talked to is male. So it, I'm, I'm interested in how you might deal with the music industry and the problems that your students are going to come up against within that kind of um, framework. Yeah, that's a, that's a very, very interesting question. And it's it's still the case, you know, as I mentioned before, we know that even amongst our staff, you know, we've we've still got issues of recruitment diversity and that's that's not perfect and we, we need to discuss it. Um, the, the module that I, I mentioned about the, the peer feedback is uh, a module we do called Music Entrepreneurship. And one of the things that we look at as well is part of overcoming some of these barriers could be to go out and set up kind of organisations yourself and to find your own space within the music industry and empowering students to be able to do that. I don't think we can rely on some of the, without wanting to be too indiscreet, some of the major labels are actually fully tackling this, although some have, you know, made some reasonable efforts. Um, but it is about trying to have a dialogue with industry and also to be uh, understanding what are those particular skills that they're looking for and recognising that we have such a diverse student body that we can, if we can provide them with those skills, then they'll be able to, to enter those jobs. Um, but I'd, it's difficult having the conversation with industry because a lot of the time they're like, well, the degree doesn't mean anything to them. You know, you don't have to do a degree to come and work for the music industry. And they've got a fine supply line. You know, they've got thousands of, of young people competing for internships. But I think part of it is also to pivot our kind of uh, expectations for the students, but also to pivot to also working with SMEs and smaller and medium enterprises as a, as a route in and supporting those smaller businesses by giving them student placements and students who are going to contribute to that, rather than just focusing on the, the main parts of the industry and hopefully the more cottage industry side of things could kind of grow and progress. But it has, you know, so the idea our students have faced resistance. Uh, there's unconscious biases rife within the music industry. I don't need to tell anybody in this room that <laughs> it's, it's, it's a challenge. Negotiate that, I think, but without feeling that they have to put up with it. Yeah, um, exactly. The feedback that some students get is that, well, that's how it is in the real world. So you have to negotiate, which I yeah. think is the wrong way to go about it. And the key change. Um, there are initiatives, so yes. I guess steering students towards that with, I mean, you're up against it, Sam. Yeah. Ways. Um, even within HE, mm. uh, you know, there are staff who, who it, it was what Jenny said, it's, it's sometimes it's not the what, it's the how. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think part of this is we, we, uh, you know, my colleagues and I have a mission because we we look at our classroom and we say this is what the music industry should look like, and we want to do what we can to bring these students. I mean, these students into industry. This is our passion and our mission as educators to be able to do that. But it is, you know, we do interact with you, do bring in guest speakers on these various different initiatives. But quite a lot of the time, the big issue as well is finance and money and trying to find ways around that is is a very very difficult challenge but another aspect that we do as well is where students may not necessarily um, well all students have protected characteristics but if they're not from a marginalized background to understand the power and the importance of advocating for their colleagues and actually a lot of them are surprised you know i've had students talk about how they change their names on job applications uh, because they don't want to be uh, perceived as inferior and loads of the students who didn't have that problem were completely shocked and surprised and never heard that before and it was like yes don't you know this is a real issue happening and they passionately want to go out and advocate for that change as well so if they are in the position of privilege to get into industry spaces that they can also advocate for that change as part of that process i could i could give you an extremely long answer to this Sue, but i'm just no, 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 it's, it's, it's really interesting because it's all very yeah. from your yeah. end 
Um, but having worked in post 92s now for the last 11 years as well, uh, there are it's mapped onto class a lot of the music. Yeah, totally. Um, and you do tend to see marketing attracting more men. Yeah. Um, and so I think things are changing. So I'm I'm well done for um, getting it through with your course, Sam. That there, there are more people. Yeah. Thank you, Sue. So we'll we'll push on here with a few last questions, and there's some comments in the chat as well relating to what uh, what Sue brought up as well. So Faye. Over to you. Hello. Um, thanks, all speakers. It's been really, really interesting. Um, I'm really interested in that, like the heading of this event, quality and inclusion, and and how they interact. And I'd love to hear any any examples, or oh, I don't know if I want heartwarming stories or depressing stories, but like where when you include people, that like it was. Oh, I'm not being very articulate, sorry. Uh, the thing of who's judging, I think is really, really important. So have you had any experiences, any of you, um, where you've tried to open things up and be very inclusive, but then you've ended up being somebody judging it as not as good quality as you want it to be. For example, like students marking stuff, you don't think they're doing it well enough. I don't know, maybe this is or isn't. But so have you found it difficult to actually be able to give over power? How do we give over power if we don't agree on the frames of quality i don't know if that's a really really negative kind of question but i'm interested to hear anyone's thoughts on that kind of thing or have you had experienced other people not recognizing your vision of quality maybe we could put it i don't know what anything yeah controversial <laughs> i don't know jillian did you i, I thought you were on me oh, you, you said you didn't you you don't want heartwarming stories and you want you want the opposite is that was that what you just saying Faith? sorry I, I don't I, know just some nitty-gritty bits yeah is it where is it really yeah, difficult yeah. to do that like personally is it difficult to give over power like that or mm -hmm. I, I, you know, or have you had a better experience of trying to take power i was gonna sort of sorry i was gonna go on some heartwarming stuff but i won't do that <laughs> um i understand the question and yeah it's quite a tough one I mean, I, no, I'll, no, I don't think I'll, I'll answer what you want to hear about. Sam, do you have an answer? Do you want to? Oh gosh, just pop in, Jenny. Go, I've, got, I've got something <laughs> that I can contribute. Yeah, do you want to go first, and I'll pop in after. Well, it's interesting because I was going to, I put my hand up, I was going to sort of raise a similar sort of thing. And I think this power relations are really interesting, aren't they? It came through um, our research study really clearly. And I was thinking when Sam was talking about, you know, those discourses. And there's, I think there's two things that I'll say. The, one of the reasons why um, the, the Musoc project came about was uh, a conversation between myself and, and Lee Higgins, who, who's my research partner. Um, and I was working in, in evaluating projects and uh, observing community music projects and projects that were billed as being incredibly inclusive and it was democratic and this was about participation, right? And, you know, the, the sort of history here is community music as a sort of uh, a field of study is very anti music education, you know, so we're teasing through these, you know, what is the issue here? What's the problem? There's a deficit culture. You don't do that. Therefore, we do kind of thing. And I experienced this at a conference, actually. So I went to uh, a conference. Um, I won't tell you what it is because I don't really want to out the person, but um, I, it was this is really participatory. Everybody can join in. It's, you know, researchers, all sort of international people working at the level that we do. And uh, yeah, bring your instrument and let's all play. So I took my flute along and, and there we go. And we started off with um, a, a singing activity. Let's all sing. And I wasn't very well and I'd lost my voice. And so there were three groups. If you like singing, be in that group. If you don't, you know, if you're not so good, be in that group. If you want to do body cushion being that group which instantly is exclusion in it you've got to self-exclude yourself from the singing um and i went in the body percussion group because i, I couldn't sing it was really frustrating because if you love singing it's actually really hard not to sing right so i thought 
I'll get my flute out. This is participatory. It's democratic. We can all input into the creative thing. So I got my flute out, and it, yeah, I used to do a lot of acid jazz playing in the nineties, you know. And, and um, so I got my flute out, and I joined in. And the facilitator um, turned round and stared at me. So this was not part of the plan for me to get my flute out. This was meant to be a vocal only activity, and I had two choices. Right, put my flute back in the box and just behave or carry on playing and I decided to carry on playing and afterwards I I, uh, I was actually stood next to Lee at the time I said I said did you feel that and he went yeah right <laughs> so it wasn't just me that felt that and that was that that happened in maybe 2016 I think and that was one of my observations so practice that quite often is being built as inclusive practice democratic um actually yeah. it's very formulaic people are told what to play when to play and how yeah. to play. and that was why we kind of initiated this project because we just wanted to get underneath that and understand what what all that was about and you know it's funding related isn't it these are the words that we have to put on our funding applications to get the cash in you know there's 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 lots of things there, but that's a very, very good sort of example of power as well, and the power of the facilitator and how difficult it, it was for that person to pass that power over um, to people who are who are peers, you know, international researchers, etc. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was going to ask ask you, Sam, about those power relations in that assessment process, but we're probably out of time, are we? <laughs> We are out of time, but Sam, if you want to say the last thing about uh, response to Jenny's dad, I think, I think we have time for that. Uh, just just in response to, to Faye's question about kind of quality and inclusion, for, for me, the, the issue that I come across is that really it should be the students who are kind of drivers on what quality of inclusion is and whether they feel included or not, they, they should have the, the kind of input on that. But quite a lot of the problems that we're seeing at the moment is that um, I found a lot of kind of government responses and government policy to be very, very difficult to work around. So I mentioned, for example, the thing about online teaching, being told we could hardly do that anymore, that funding is particularly a problem and that access to, to student loans has been all kinds of issues. There's the issues with the BTEC grades, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and what we're seeing really is that the, the people who should be making those judgment calls are not in a position to do so and have been disempowered by these hierarchies that exist that are very res resistant to change. And I think that should, we should always be conscious of that and try and collect research to be able to, to show that and demonstrate that. So that's just a, a final thought on that one. Okay, so thank you all three of our presenters. It's been great and really interesting to listen to your experiences and your thoughts. And uh, everybody who came, and I'm sorry for the slightly chaotic start of this session, but I'm happy that so many of you actually managed to make you make it into to one Zoom room if not the first one we attempted with. Uh, I'm not a hundred percent certain when the next one is. Faye, do you do you have that in front of you? I don't have it in front of me. Uh, nope. Keep talking, I'll see if I find it. <laughs> uh, but uh, Lorden, who just had to leave here, I said that the EDIMS report will be launched on the 16th of November. So do keep an eye out on social media and other places to, to make sure you don't, don't miss that. We got a little bit of a, a taster of Sam mentioning, mentioning it here. So really good. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for coming and uh, have a great end of the day. Thank you. I'm just going to close on this now. Bye bye. Yeah, no, I can't find it. <laughs>